Well, I want to welcome everybody to the review for Block 3. <clears throat> and um, as you know, there are going to be 34 or 35 PowerPoint images on the exam, and all the questions are going to come from the images that I'm going to go over right now. So the first question you'll probably see will be something related to being able to tell the difference between um, lesions or tumors, whatever, upper motor neuron, lower motor neuron, premotor areas, uh, damage to the basal ganglia, and damage to the cerebellum, and be able to differentiate some of these signs and symptoms. I think we've gone over the corticospinal tract quite a lot, but just remember that those corticospinal fibers start up in cortex. They go all the way through the internal capsule, down through the brainstem, decusate in the pyramid and the caudal medulla, and then go down the contralateral, that is, to their origin, contralateral side of the spinal cord. And you get many, many interesting things. You know them all. Um, you, of course, have weakness with no atrophy. You have spasticity, which is a unilateral increase in resistance when you try to move a, move a limb. And it's especially dependent upon how fast you move it. The more you move it, the faster you move it, the more resistance you get. When I say increased reflexes, there are a couple different kinds of reflexes. Some we call superficial, and that would be like the abdominal or the Babinski, and some we call deep, like the patella or the biceps. These reflexes, of, of course, are increased with an upper motor neuron lesion. And you have the Babinski with the toe um, going up, clonus, which is an oscillation of either the foot or the hand when you keep resistance on it. Hoffman would be when you flick uh, the index fingers and all the fingers will then flex. And uh, loss of abdominal reflex, you know what that is when you stroke uh, oh, an ice cream stick to or from the, the umbilicus. Uh, you don't get the normal reflex. So these are all upper motor. Now lower motor neuron, I didn't listen here, but you know what those are. There you would have reduced or absent reflexes and you'd have um, atrophy. Now the key word for premotor areas is apraxia, apraxia. This of course is not aphasia. It of course is not uh, ataxia. Ataxia is just in coordination. You know what aphasia is, that's a language problem. Apraxia is uh, damage to premotor planning areas where you can't plan the movement. So basically sometimes you're, you'll uh, be asked to do, a patient will be asked to do a movement. They can't do the movement when being asked, but they might just do it kind of like when they're not even thinking about doing it. So there's no weakness or anything like that. There's no upper motor neuron problems with a premotor lesion. And of course, we discussed two premotor areas. We discussed the lateral premotor area, and we discussed the supplementary motor area. Now, with basal ganglia lesions, the way I think about it is you're going to either have too much movement or too little movement. In the case of um, Parkinson's, you have too little movement. In the case of Huntington's chorea, or even with hemibolism, you're going to have uncontrolled too much movement. Um, you should understand that in a Parkinson's problem, you're going to have a, a resting tremor, not a movement tremor. A movement tremor is the same thing as an intention tremor. There, that's associated with a cerebellum. Bradykinesia, not much movement. Rigidity. Rigidity is not related to spasticity. Rigidity is like an iron pipe. If you try to move an iron pipe, it's kind of going to resist you no matter which way you try to move it. Spasticity is usually uh, 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 di uh, direction dependent. Then, of course, we come to our good old cerebellum with a lot of great interesting names that we've used, I hope, numerous times during the course. Uh, here again now, don't, don't, don't forget, the first thing you ever heard about cerebellum was that the deficits were going to be ipsilateral. We finally worked through why they're ipsilateral, and we use such terms as dysdeodocokinesia, where you can't supinate and pronate real fast. Rebound, you've all seen that in class many times. Somebody's pulled on my arm and let go, and I banged a speaker. Um, dysarthria, dysarthria is just in coordination of speech. And you know, the cerebellum is the big coordinator in the sky. So dysarthria is going to be uh, seen quite often when you have incoordinated speech with cerebellar deficits. And then 
Here we are with our cerebellum with an intention tremor or movement tremor. Uh, I think we've also used words like dysmetria, metria meaning measure or distance. So you, you touch, your, touch your nose and you go by it, that's called pass pointing. So make sure you know the difference between a resting tremor with a basal ganglia problem and a tension tremor with the cerebellum. This will probably be the first question uh, that you'll see of the neuro questions. And um, I'll probably list a number of things for each one of these. And you know, that some, sometimes there'll be one in there that I'll just stick in there. It uh, might be the first one, it might be the middle one, or it might be the last one, but be careful. This will be your first question. So, and also, I think this is one of the most important PowerPoints that, that we have in this course. So I expect everybody to get this one correct. I hope, at least. Then we went on, and I showed you this image. This is the second slide. Um, I've seen better images of the, of the cortex and cerebellum, but I like it. Um, you can see the cerebellum there a bit down here. Um, right here overlying the, the great brain stem. Back in here would be the occipital lobe. This would be the temporal lobe right here. I'd call this the parietal lobe, all the way up to this sulcus here. The central sulcus here, that arrow is the central sulcus, so this would be parietal, occipital, temporal. Anything in front of the central sulcus, you gotta call frontal. So this would be frontal all the way out here. Frontal would include the motor strip, A, it would include the premotor areas. This would be supplementary motor area D. C would be the lateral premotor area. A is, of course, the motor strip. And B is somatosensory cortex. This is where VPM and VPL are going here. So here's your central sulcus. You could call this post-central gyrus. You could call this central sulcus. You could call this pre-central gyrus, but we know them as a motor strip. and Areas 3, 1, and 2 here for the somatosensory strip. D and C we would call premotor areas. And both of these areas have the number 6 associated with them. And then when we get out here in front of the premotor areas, this is prefrontal. Prefrontal, and this is where we're thinking about our friend Phineas Gage and all those executive decisions. I heard the other day, I was talking to my son, who's going to be 27, and I, he told me that now his prefrontal cortex is mature because um, they say that it takes at least 26 years for this to mature. Um, this morning in some of our cases in, uh, in anatomy, I think that somebody said that the brain wasn't mature until you're 20 years old. Um, so anyway, we have a couple different things there. But, you know, 26, just think when you're 26, this is still, well, almost 26, this is still developing here. Right here is a good one, right down in here, boy. Whew. This I would call left hemisphere also. Broca speech area. Some people call this the inferior, inferior frontal gyrus. Well, why would that be called the inferior frontal gyrus? Well, you kind of just go superior, middle, kind of hard to see, but inferior frontal gyrus. Here's your lateral fissure right here. Lateral fissure. Uh, better known as the sylvian fissure. Uh, you might be aware that there's a very important artery that runs up through this lateral fissure called the middle cerebral artery, running right up through here and going to lots of places. That middle cerebral is running right up through here. Here's your superior temporal gyrus. And if we were to open up this lateral fissure here, we'd see the primary auditory gyri that are running a little bit tangentially here on this on this gyrus. So they'd be 41 and 42. And then an area that kind of surrounds this primary auditory area we call Wernicke's. Wernicke's area here. Up in here is parietal, like 5 and 7. You don't have to know those numbers. Back here, 17. Here's your temporal lobe, your lateral surface of the temporal lobe. And of course, we spent a lot of time talking about the ventral underneath, ventral medial part of the temporal lobe which is, of course, where you have your hippocampus and olfactory cortex and things like that. Now, one long-standing uh, neuroanatomical question is always, you know, what artery supplies this part of the precentral gyrus or motor strip and this sensory strip? Well, this is all this area out here would be the middle, middle cerebral. And, you know, you got your thumb and your face and your hand out here. 
And of course, if you then, so this is shown right here, middle. And then on the medial wall here, on the medial wall of the motor strip, you'll have the leg. And on the medial wall of the sensory strip, you'll have the leg. But one little tantalizing little question is always, what D here is a supplementary motor area. And there's some of D, some of the supplementary motor area out here on the lateral surface that's supplied by the middle cerebral. Of course, lateral premotor is supplied only by the middle cerebral. But then there's some of D that goes on the medial wall here. So you have the sensory strip, the motor strip, leg, leg, and then you have some planning, some premotor on the medial wall that would be supplied by the anterior cerebral. So you have to be careful with that. Um, in general, uh, this planning area depends upon external stimuli. And in general, this planning area uh, internally generates the, uh, the planned movement. So you might be careful there. Like, uh, let's say if we blew out the anterior cerebral artery, one question would be, would you have any problem in, in planning? And you would because there's some of SMA on the medial wall. So you, this is kind of cool. You could have some problems with planning, and then you could have some problems with moving, you know, planning the leg, but also even in moving the darn leg because you got the motor strip. And then you move a little bit back, you, you could have problems in feeling the leg. So no middle cerebrals out here, okay? And anterior cerebrals on the medial wall like this. And then you know from our blood supply lecture that a lot of this medial part of the temporal lobe which is going to have the oncus and amygdala and going to have the hippocampus, parahippocampal gyrus, all that olfactory cortex in it. But then, of course, also back here, back in here, you're going to have area 17 for visual cortex. So think about that. Um, what else could you get damaged up in by the middle cerebral? Well, if you're on the right side here, you could, you could get damaged back in here. That would give you left neglect. So think about that. All right, I think I probably answered about everything in here. Let's see here. Uh, uh, let's see uh, anything interesting up here. Is this area 4A? Well, yeah, area 4, that's too easy. M1, yes, precentral gyrus. Let me see. Oh, contain cells that fire only the contra leg moves. What, what am I saying? A. Oh, no, you couldn't, fire, you couldn't move your contra leg by firing a cell at A. You know that. Uh, contain cells that fire before the movement, of course. They have to fire before the movement because they, this area has got to send its axons all the way down to the lower motor neurons in the spinal cord, and the lower motor neurons got to go out, go through the neuro, and then turn on the muscle. So, of course, that's true. Um, how about do cortical spinal axons <clears throat> fire in relation to force? Yes, they do. Yes, they do. So, it, it'll... If it needs more force, it fires a little more. If it needs less force, it fires a little less. And then, of course, they also fire in relationship to direction. I don't think I put that up there. Um, three, one, and two, we know that. I don't think we need to dwell on that. VPL, VPM, yes. How about this? Cells fire when simply squeezing a spring. Well, if you're squeezing a spring with your fingers, you're going to have the motor cortex right in this area. The finger area is hand area firing. But remember, once, once you start to move, all that sensory information is going to come back up here to the hand area, right back in the somatosensory cord. So you're going to have cells firing right here and right there. Planning, we talked about area six. We did all that, I think. Planning, lesions of planning are apraxia, apraxia. Uh, I think that pretty much covered internally, externally, posterior parietal, okay, PML, can you, okay. All right, I think nobody's going to miss this question. If anybody misses this question, I'm going to be extremely upset. Now, I'm getting up, going up and getting my Coke, which is in front of the room. I'm actually over in a little room, 1309, where all the PAs uh, have their meetings, I'm sitting in the first row. I had my feet up on the table, but now, um, anything else in here? I don't think. So let's move on. Let's find something. Let's say, oh, I'll ask you one more question. Oh, why don't I go back? Why don't I ask you one question here? Always leave you with a question. Um, hmm. 
Hmm. Think of other ways of getting dysarthria, which is incoordination of speech. How else could you have incoordinated speech? Now, we're not talking about an aphasia here like Broca's or Wernicke's. We're talking about incoordination of speech. Just think about that. I, you know, uh, that'll give you something to think about on this slide. You know, on this slide right here, <clears throat> oh, let's just say if you blew out your middle cerebral artery, would your auditory cortex on the same side lose its blood supply? And what are the numbers of the auditory cortex? That'll, I'll leave you on that one. So let's go to the next. Oh, you know I love this. Basal ganglia? Let's go through the players. Well, everybody's been sending him emails that said, we don't understand the slides, Big John, because you didn't go over them like you did in brainstem, and I, I feel guilty, but of course, you know, I feel guilty about everything. But um, as we go up in the thalamus and basal ganglia, as we go rostral to level 10, remember I told you, you're either going to have the basal ganglia here, or you're going to have the thalamus. Now, if you start from the midbrain, you're going to see more thalamus first, and then as, it, as the thalamus gets smaller, the basal ganglia will get bigger and you've got these limbs of the internal capsule. That's basically it. As you go rostral, you're going to have thalamus or you're going to have basal ganglia. And down below, you're going to have a little hypothalamus and a few other little things. So let's go over this, okay? <clears throat> here's the caudate and here's the putamen. Together, they're called the what? Well, I hope you know it's the striatum. Then you go right in this little, well, they call this lens-shaped, but uh, I've had some questions about that. Here's your putamen. Notice what it looks like. Does it look like the globus pallidus or does it look like the cauda? Well, that's why together these are called the striatum. It's really one big nuclear group divided by the internal capsule. But the cells in here and the cells in here are exactly the same. Now, this whole thing here is called the lenticular nucleus. Lenticular, which is the putamen and the globus pallidus in here. And then, of course, we have two parts of the globus pallidus. We have an external, and we have an internal. And the outflow of the basal ganglia is going to come from this internal segment. One of my favorite pathways is called the ANSA, little jug handle. You can just see this like a, a little handle on a beer. At, at your, oh, you don't, have, you don't have handles. I was thinking of the terrace, but those are cups, aren't they? Well, let's see, where could you, oh, I know, well, there's, a, there's that one place downtown that's got those big mugs, but the, let's see, they don't have handles either. Oh, maybe over in Ireland you'd have a handle. But that's called the ANSA, ANSA lenticularis, goes up to the VAVL. When I think of the VAVL, I think of the motor, 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 I've said it three times, motor thalamus. From the motor thalamus, of course, it's got to go through the internal capsule to go back up here to motor-related cortical areas. Now, so let's go through this. The cell body of the ansa lenticularis right here would be in GPI. Now, here's an adjacent section. Here's an adjacent, uh, l just a little bit rostral or caudal, where we have this good-looking subthalamic nucleus right here. See that right there. What else we have here would be the posterior limb of the internal capsule. What always sits on the, on, the, on, the, on the cerebral peduncle, so here's your posterior limb coming down into the cerebral, always sitting right here is going to be the nigra. Substantia nigra, there's the ruber duber, which we know, of course. A little dis different section, but remember, if it's sitting on the peduncle here, it's the nigra. So you won't confuse it with the subthalamic nucleus, which sits up a little bit higher. Other things in here you might know, here's a little bit of putamen right here. Here's some thalamus. I wouldn't expect you to identify it, but there is one big medial nucleus that, that everybody knows called medial dorsal. Here's a little bit of the optic tract, which of course I wouldn't expect you to understand, to, to know, because we haven't spent time. But this is a very convenient little thing going under the lenticular nucleus. Wow, I didn't even know that one. I, I should have asked this. Anyway, this part, of, here's your posterior limb. This part of the internal capsule is going under the lenticular nucleus, so we call it sublenticular. And it, you know, and it's going out in here to the primary auditory cortex. So these axons right here have their cell bodies in the thalamus and the medial geniculate body. 
So sublenticular, medial geniculate body, which is caudal to this, have to send their axons under the lenticular nucleus to go out to areas 41 and 42. So here we're showing some, remember now, the direct pathway just goes from the striatum into GPI and on you go. And that's going to increase motor activity. And here we're showing some of the indirect pathway. But of course, the ancillenticularis serves both. And then, of course, we put a few lesions in here. Uh, you know my favorite lesion from uh, talking about my experiences in 1969 in, um, when I was a postdoctoral fellow in Manhattan. Can you imagine me living in Manhattan? I tell you. Anyway, I did. And the uh, first day I did my postdoc, I walked in and I saw the monkey uh, from my mentor that had a lesion in the subthalamic nucleus. And the monkey had an arm and a leg contralateral to the damage in the subthalamic nucleus that was just going, ro going in a rotary fashion, almost unstoppable. So that meant too much movement. The, the monkey had a lesion right there. So it couldn't stop its movement. It had, it had uncontrolled movement. So this subthalamic nucleus, these cells use glutamate, and they excite the GPI. Well, it was no longer exciting the GPI, so the GPI was firing less. If the old GPI fires less, the old, this whole thing is going gonna, gonna to inhibit the thalamus less. So you're going to have increased movement. So a lesion here and sub, too much movement because you're no longer ex providing normal excitation to the GPI and the GPI fires less. What else? Okay, now let's try a lesion at GP. It's for this one right here. GPE, which is right here, does what to the sub? It inhibits the sub. So if you lose that inhibition, this guy's going to fire like crazy. It's going to be the opposite of having a lesion in the sub. Having too much, instead of having too much movement, you're going to have too little movement. So once you know the sub, if you just go back and say, I'm going to think about Big John back in 1969 trying to live in Manhattan, and that first day he went to work and the monkey had a lesion in the subthalamic nucleus, and the monkey was just going on and on and on and on with too much movement in the contralateral arm and leg. And you can handle anything. Of course, if you got too much movement, what are you going to do with dopamine? You're going to pr try to calm it down, inhibit dopamine. What are you going to do with acetylcholine? Well, you're going to try to slow down that direct pathway, so you're going to use acetylcholine agonist. If you if you have too okay, if you don't have if you got too little movement, you're going to use a dopamine uh, agonist, and you're going to try to inhibit that acetylcholine. So I don't imagine too many people are going to miss this. Let's see. Would I ask you to identify these individual structures here? Oh, I'd probably just have this up here or have this up here. I'll try to help you out. Uh, transmitter here from cortex, I hope you know, is glutamate, only because it's, I want you to know it's excitatory. This, sub, this projection from the subthalamic nucleus uses glutamate, and this uh, thalamocortical pathway from VAL, VAVL uses glutamate too. All right, so I'll leave you with a question here. Uh, da, 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 do. Let me see here. Um, what would happen? What would happen if you stimulated? Stimulated, you stuck an electrode in the ansel lenticularis. There's no lesion here. What would happen if I stuck an electrode in the ansa lenticularis and stimulated it so it fired more? Okay, I'm not jamming it. I want it to fire more. Would you have less or more movement? Okay, well, you know, I'll let you think about that for a while. You can email me if you really aren't sure. Let's go to the next one. Okay, now, I know how you feel about cerebellum. I've taught this course 40 times. 41, because one year I had to teach it twice. Never have I been satisfied with how we present the cerebellum. I don't know what it is about the cerebellum. The first time I ever gave a cerebellum lecture was my first year as an assistant professor. And I will tell you that I was working with, I, uh, there was a very famous neuroscientist in the Department of Anatomy who hired me. 
And he was very steeped in the literature, and uh, he's world famous. And I said to him, um, Dr. Guillory, um, I would like some advice on what to talk about in the cerebellum to, med- to medical students. He had a very nice English accent. And he looked at me and he says, well, I, I, I don't know if I could do the English accent. Well, John, uh, 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 there was a Nobel Prize winner for the, his work on the cerebellum. I said, oh, you know, being from the Midwest, I wasn't familiar with all the Nobel Prize winners. He said his name was Sir John Eccles, Sir John Eccles. And I said, okay, and I mean, and then, then, then he kind of looked at me like, you know, okay, there's your clue, kid. I walked away, and I went and got Eccles' book and all his papers, and every one of Eccles' papers was related to this up here. And, you know, on and on and on and on. And in the end, you know, Eccles worked out the circuitry of the cerebellar cortex. And he knew everything about Amasi, and he wrote papers on the climate, and he wrote papers on the granule cell with its bifurcation, and then the bifurcation went to the parallel fiber, and each parallel fiber contacted so many Golgi cells and so many Purkinje cells and so many basket cells, and then each basket cell contact on, and I read for months and months and months and months so that I could impress him with my lecture. And I gave an hour on the, on the cerebellum. I had electron micrographs. I had every little synapse in the world. And, this, and the lecture was over. And um, the, the, uh, some medical student in the back row said, well, Dr. Hardy said, what happens if you have a lesion? And I'm looking, I look up, well, you know, come on, I'm talking about Sir John Eccles' research here. What happens to you if you have a lesion? You know, so, you know, you know, I wasn't really quite sure what happened if you had a lesion. So, as you can tell, we moved further from this and more to kind of like trying to figure out the important things that for you to know when you see a patient. And when you see a patient, you're going to see certain things that I listed on that first slide, you know, like rebound, dystheodococinesia, uh, intention, all those kind of things. It's always going to be ipsilateral. And so, my, my philosophy have been, has been, let's try to figure out why it's ipsilateral, and uh, let's make sure we understand when it goes wrong, and then if we can give you some IDs here, that's fine. But this is so complicated, and I think for medical students, we need to move over here and try to just be able to answer some questions. But I still am dissatisfied with how we present the cerebellum to you every year, and I apologize. But let's go over some basics on the cerebellum. Remember, if, we have, if we're planning a movement or thinking or carrying out a movement, we're going to start up here. We're going to send it through the cerebral peduncle, down through the pons. So we're going to synapse into pontine gray. But remember, the cortical spinals are going to keep going down and cross. Then what we want to do is going to be relayed by these pontine gray. Remember, there's millions and millions and millions of these pontine gray cells here that get the information from the cortical pontine fiber. Those pontine gray cells cross, have axons, pontocerebellars, that cross and go through and enter the cerebellum in the middle cerebellar peduncle. So a lesion in this middle cerebellar peduncle means that this side of the cerebellum is not going to function correctly, and we're going to have ipsilateral incoordination to the peduncle lesion. If we had a lesion down here in the pontine gray, the opposite cerebellum isn't going to function. So to this pontine gray, we're going to have coordination on the opposite side. So then it's going to tell the cerebellar. Now this information right here is coming in from the pont. These pontocerebellars are going to end as a mossy fiber. And these mossy fibers can climb up and go to a granule cell or they can go in and turn on a deep nucleus directly. So this could be one of the deep nuclei, and we talked mostly about nucleus interpositus. Now, remember, coming up on this same side in the inferior cerebellar peduncle 
They're going to have the dorsal spinal cerebellar tract, cuneo cerebellar tract, and don't forget the cross olive um, from the olive. All of those cerebellars are in the inferior cerebellar pedicle. But coming up in the dorsal spinal cerebellar tract is kind of like what's really happening to your limbs. Stuff coming down from cortex here to the cerebellum is what we want to do. We keep it going down to the spinal cord, and then things start to happen, and then that DSCT comes in here, and it's also coming in as a mossy fiber, all right? Goes to a granule cell. The granule cell has an axon that goes up and splits into a parallel fiber. A parallel fiber can then turn on no, numerous cells, but it's going to turn on this big Purkinje cell here. But think, there are millions and millions of these parallel fibers, the Purkinje cell then is inhibitory on the deep nucleus. The deep nucleus then, well, here are our deep nuclei. The deep nuclei are going to send their axons out the superior cerebellar peduncle, cross. Some are going to go into the ruber duber, sluber. Some are going to keep going up to VAVL of the thalamus. The correction could be made up here. Now, you could also make the correction right here. The red nucleus can get information, and then the red nucleus is going to have cells whose axons cross immediately and descend in the rubral spinal tract. Now, if I had a lesion in the rubral spinal tract, you would have an ipsilateral deficit. If I had a lesion in the ruber itself, it would be a contralateral deficit. All right, so let's go through here. If you had a, uh, let's say here, um, if you had a lesion of the superior cerebellar peduncle, you have ipsilateral incoordination. If you had, let's see, what's it? Lesion one here is a cerebral peduncle. And we're only talking about cortical pontine fibers, not cortical spinals or bulbars that are also in here. So let's say you lost your cortical pontines here. Where would your incoordination be? Well, they're not going to get down here. This isn't going to tell this the right stuff. So to this lesion, if you had cortical pontine fibers, just cortical pontines, you have a contralateral incoordination. Contralateral incoordination, ipsilateral, ipsilateral, ipsilateral. Now contra here and contra here, but once the rubrospinal tract crosses, ipsilateral. Now let's go over here and answer some of these things here. One, what's one? Oh, one is a mossy. One is a what? A mossy. A mossy. And can it arise from Clark's? Yes, accessory cunea. Now, two. Where's two? Oh, the inferior olive. The inferior olive is also going to send a little twig to the deep nucleus, but then it's also going to climb up there around that Purkinje cell and have a huge influence on that Purkinje cell in motor learning, in motor learning. Yes, we should know that. Three, PERC powerfully, powerfully inhibits the deep nucleus. Yes, it does. But remember, that deep nucleus, which is going to send its information like this, that deep nucleus is getting excitation from, from the olive directly and from the mossy. So it's excited. It's just now this, which means it's inhibitory input, just going to kind of fine tune it, modulate it. When it fires, when it fires, this will fire less. If, it, if this, you know, so this is firing up and down, modulating this input. Let's see, firing rate determined by mosses climbing. Yes, oh my goodness, let's see, what else? I guess that's about it. Let's see, five. Oh, let's go five right here. That's a parallel fiber. Let's see what I said about. The firing is related to mossy fiber granule cell firing. Well. Here's your mossy fiber granule cell firing. So yes, well, how this fires, these parallel fibers will fire. The synapses on perks are modulated by climbing. Oh my goodness, yes. Can you imagine on all these little parallel fibers, just, you know, there are millions of them, but you know, they don't, you know, there's millions. So they don't have that much of a influence because all, all million are not terminating on that perk. But my goodness, Think about the climbing fiber. One climbing fiber is going to go to only a few Purkinje cells. So that climbing fiber has a huge, huge influence on the firing of the per parallel fibers, much less. 
Cerebellum, I love it. Okay, one question I could ask you. Ooh, so you know ataxia? You sure that's not aphasia? Are you sure that's not apraxia? Oh, movement tremor. Oh, Pierre, movement tremor. Is that the same as an intention tremor? And oh, by the way, Pierre, is that different than a resting tremor in basal ganglia disease? Oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. The other thing you might want to think of, are, what are the two decusations in this whole system that we've emphasized for a lot? Okay, so, oh, the question. Did I leave a question? Let's see. Mm -hmm. um, oh, here's one. Let's say I had a lesion in the decusation of the superior cerebellar peduncle. I had a lesion right there. What would happen to your patient? All right. Next slide. Oh, now we're in vision. I had to take a swig. I only got till 4 o'clock. I'm not going to make this. Anyway, or was it 5? But anyway, um, Dr. Heatley, one of my former students. Oh, this, what is this? I want to round up. Does everybody know what that means? This is your lens. It always wants to round up. So these zonial fibers here, are putting some tension on it, and it kind of flattens it. And these zonial fibers are being controlled by these muscles here, the radial fibers and the circular fibers. Ciliary body, the ciliary body is right here. The ciliary body includes these muscle radial fibers, circular fibers, and there's cells around here that make the aqueous. So, when these fibers, circular and radials, contract, both of them, they take pressure off the zonial fibers, and this will round up. Now, this will be controlled by cranial nerve 3. Uh, Postganglionic parasympathetics would be where? They'd be in the ciliary ganglion. All right. Now, when we go in here, it's kind of different. Here are the circular fibers of the iris. Now these, when these constrict, it's going to make the pupil smaller. So this is under parasympathetic control. These radial fibers here, right here, are going to make this pupil size, going to pull it this way and make the pupil larger. So these are under sympathetic control. So as far as the parasympathetic control to these circular fibers, it would start out of edinger westfall go to ciliary ganglion, Postganglionic end would come in here for Paris. And here in the sympathetics, <clears throat> you know, you've got to get everything out of T1, T2, go up the trunk to the superior cervical ganglion from the superior cervical ganglion. Those postganglionics are going to come in here to the dilator. So this is your iris. So here's your trabecular meshwork where that aqueous is reabsorbed. Here would be uh, the cornea where most of the the light is bent much more than in the lens, but of course the lens can, uh, we can control the lens. Um, let's see, this is your anterior chamber, this is your posterior chamber, this is your vitreous chamber right here. Uh, I think that's about all I'd probably want to, oh, I know. Um, we didn't talk much about transmitters, but preganglionic um, pairs would be what, cholinergic and postganglionic are cholinergic, and I think uh, for the sympathetics, uh, preganglionics would be cholinergic, post, or norepi. Uh, we haven't talked about that, so I probably won't ask you that. Um, that's that. I kind of like this one. Um, let's go to the next one. Oh, the retiny. So when you look at this, right, this one right here, you should kind of know where the vitreous would be. Where would the vitreous be? Well, it would be right in here. So this would be your ganglion cell layer, right here. Here would be your bipolars, rods and cones, your, the tips of the rods and cones. Here's your pigmented layer right here, pigmented epithelium. Here's your choroid. Ooh, that choroid, it's got some blood in it. So the blood back in here would be coming from what? What artery? Probably the posterior ciliaries, which would be a branch of the ophthalmic. Um, what else would I, well, cones are good for what? They're good for color and acuity. Rods, they help you see uh, later, you know, at dark, help you watch those stars. 
out there, if you've got a if you've got a date and you're out there looking at the moon, you're going to be losing those using those rods. No, I don't mean losing your rods. I mean using their rods. Um, cones go. They have a private line to the ganglion cell for acuity. These cones will go right to one bipolar and jump into a ganglion. These poor cones. I mean, my goodness, they don't have a private line. They got to share a bipolar. Here you got those three rods here sharing one bipolar. I think I asked you where the optic disc is. The optic, since these ganglion cell axons are going this way, the optic disc has to be this way. And also, these are these axons right here from these ganglion cells are going to uh, form the axons, go through the optic disc, and form the optic nerve. So some of these are going to go to the pretectum. Some are going to go to the superior colliculus. Some are going to go to the good old lateral geniculate body. So I want you to know that. Um, here's your fovea. Here's your fovea. So these would be, what do you think? This is your ganglion cell layer, bipolar. So you can see that that image is coming right down on those receptors, rods and co cones, pure cones receptors right here. As far as numbers, I don't know. I don't like the numbers. You know this. Nobody's going to miss this slide. Let's see. Let me ask you a question now that you might not get. Ah. Mm -hmm. uh... Let's see what what's all this pigment? What do you where what happened to these rods and cones? These these uh, tips of the rods and cones, <clears throat> they're being regenerated quite often. So think about what happens to them as we as they make new ones. You got to get rid of that trash in there. That might be one question. Um, the other question would be, oh, I know one. If you're out there with your with your boyfriend or girlfriend and you're looking at the stars. Why don't you want to look directly at the star? Why, why do you want to get it a little bit off your fovea? Maybe that's a good question. That's kind of fun. A question I could leave you with. Okay, dokey. Uh, what could I? Um, let me ask. Oh, boy, what can I ask you? Mm -hmm. I don't know. You're so smart. I don't think there's anything I could ask you on this. Um, oh, I know. Um, no, I won't ask you anything. Okay, let's go to the next slide. I'm running out of time. It's 3.09. A lot of you people are doing the disarticulation of the head or, you know, all that in lab, but I skipped out. I hope I hope Dave, Dave and Miles and Phil and Karen and Dr. Bursu aren't mad at me. Next slide. Oh, my gosh, I could spend an hour on this. Everybody's worried about this. Well, I love this. Let's see, where should I start? Well, let's start here um, with, a, let's just say that this would be your nasal retina right here. This would be your temporal. Here's your chiasm. Here's your optic nerve. Here's your optic tract. Here, right here, is one of the coolest nuclei in the world, called the lateral geniculate body. This is part of the thalamus, part of the thalamus. And then you've got, of course, the pretectum and the editor westfall and all that stuff in here. And coming out of the lateral geniculate body, you've got fibers that I would consider being in the retrolenticular limb of the internal capsule, or we also call these the optic radiations, optic radiations. So the cell body for the optic radiations would be in the lateral geniculate body. Where do the optic radiations terminate? They terminate in visual cortex back here, area 17. You can also see that when these axons leave the lateral geniculate body, some sweep a little more in, into the temporal lobe here. Very famous. Myers loop, national board question all the way. That would be E. And the other ones just kind of sweep back a little more dorsally. And I'll show you that up here. So uh, Myers loop right here would be right there. And F right here would be here. Now, the reason I've shown you this is this is a roughly the location of the thalamus deep. You can see how these fibers in Myers loop are sweeping underneath the temporal lobe. So you can see how you could have a lesion in the temporal lobe here and actually have a visual field deficit. Now also, you can see how F sweeps up a little bit under the parietal cortex 
and you can have lesions in the parietal cortex, they have to be pretty deep. They have to get all, you know, underneath the, the six layers. But that's where this, these radiations are running. So, of course, you could have other deficits associated with the lesion of the left, this left area here, okay? You know, you know some of them. You, and you could have other lesions down in here with the cortex itself. But remember, these fibers, these visual fibers, are running deep. So you could get those, too. So you can kind of get some interesting deficits. All right, so that's that. What else do we know? And then down here, down here, we're looking at a medial view. So here's your ventral medial temporal lobe. So this is posterior cerebral artery. Here's your, we're talking about area six and four and three, one and two. Here's your anterior cerebral artery. And back here, getting a lot of this back here would be your posterior cerebral artery. This is the, what we call the upper bank the upper bank of the calcarine, the calcarine being this little fissure here. Upper bank of the calcarine, lower bank of the calcarine. The lower bank is going to receive Myers loop and look at the upper field. The upper bank is going to look at the lower field. So we can, we'll cover this. Don't worry. What else would you have to know on this? Uh, probably nothing else. Okay, Just know the blood supply on this medial view here. Um, let's go up and do a few lesions. Um, let's do a lesion of A. Now, <clears throat> as far as I'm concerned, you're going to get a relative afferent pupil defect only when you have a lesion of A. Now, we do know that if you have a, a pretty big detached retina, more than half the retina, you, you can get it too. Why don't we just think for our exam that you're going to, you need to have a lesion of A to get a relative afferent pupil defect. The n none of the other ones will. Trust me. Trust me. Don't make up things. Don't try to figure out how you can get a relative afferent pupil defect with these other lesions here. Please don't do that. Just take Big John's word. It happens. You get it at A. Optic nerve. Optic nerve. Three times. Optic nerve. Optic nerve. Optic nerve. None of these other ones. I've gotten many emails trying to trying to convince me why you would get a relative. And, you know, you can come up with some high flutin stuff, but don't do that. Keep it simple. Just a lesion of A. I'm not, you know, but of course, think about if you knocked off your whole retina, you could get it too. All right, let's go through these. A lesion of A, all right? Well, this eye right here, right here is going to be blind. So, I don't know whether this is the left or right eye. It depends on if you're standing on your head. But remember, I have a question in there. Would you let, rather lose your eye or your optic tract if what you want to see is as much of the visual world as possible? Would you want to have a lesion at A or would you want to have a lesion at D? And we'll talk about it. So let's also, let's just do this. What could you see if you had a lesion of A? What could you see? And for simplicity, I don't want everybody to get upset I, because this is how I look. I'm, I'm kind of, my left hand is on my left. So this is kind of left to me. So I'll, if you don't mind, I'll look at it as the left optic nerve. So I lost the left optic nerve. What can I see? Hmm. Well, let's just do a little drawing here from the whole field is this big. Oh, come on. It's going to go. From here oh, to here. Oh, let's go to this one. No, not this one. This, oh, this one. I don't want to do that one. All right. But you know what a half field is. I mean, what you see is from here all the way over to here. All right. If you lost this eye, what could you see? Well, this eye is going to see starting out here. It's going to see this point. It's going to see this point. Oh, it's going to see this point. It's going to see this point, and it's going to see this point, and it's going to go right over to there. It's not going to see this. So let's do it again. If you lose this, what can you see? You can see here, 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 and probably to there. You got, you're probably missing a quarter. You can see a lot. Okay. Now. That's what you could see, or that's what you could lose. 
Would you have a relative afferent pupil defect? Yes, you would. Yes, you would. Now, if you had this lesion, would your pupils be symmetrical? Yes, because light's coming in from this eye, and it's going back in here and working its way in. And both that and your Westfalls are getting pretty good, the same amount of information. So your pupils are going to look the same. Symmet they're going to be symmetrical in size. The reason they're going to be a little larger is there's less light reaching this black box because this A is, means there's less light getting into this whole area. You're only getting this light in from this eye. So this black box here is getting less light. The less light the Edinger Westfall gets, the less it's going to fire. And you know the Edinger Westfall constricts. So if the Edinger Westfall is firing less, the pupils will be a little larger. Symmetrical. So you come over here and put the pen light in this eye, this eye here, what's going to happen to your pupils? This one's going to constrict, right? And this one's going to constrict. Flip over here real fast, what's going to happen? You're going to watch this eye, and both eyes are going to what? Both eyes are going to die. When the light's here, it's not getting any light, they're both going to dilate, constrict, dilate, constrict, dilate, constrict. A relative afferent pupil defect at A, and the only place you're going to get it. I'm not going to do C, you know, that's, you know, well, I could do it. I could say, let's see here. Well, again, you know, if the only place you get a relative afferent pupil defect is A, it's not going to be at C. But if you cut C, you can go back to this temporal retina right here. So these fibers are coming from this temporal retina. This temporal retina, does anybody know where this temporal retina is looking? Well, first of all, is your patient going to have any real, I mean, is sitting there with their eyes open, or are they going to complain with any, about any de defect? Are you going to find any defect? Well, where is this temporal retina looking? Where is this temporal retina looking from this eye? All right, let's do this. Let's play the game again. Is it looking here? No. Is it looking here? No. Is it looking here? No. Is it looking here? Wait, wait, get up there. Yes. Is it looking here? Yes. This temporal retina is looking, here's your nose, this temporal retina is looking here, here, and here. This nasal retina, let's do the nasal retina, because I know there's some of you who are confused. Where is this nasal retina looking? Are you ready? Yes, yes, yes. Yes. Now let's do this temporal retina. Are you ready? No. 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 Yes. 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 Where's this nasal retina looking? Yes. 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 Each nasal retina sees the whole hemifield on its side. Each nasal retina sees the whole hemifield on its side. Each temporal retina looks over here, this temporal retina over here, this temporal retina over here. All right, so let's go back. And so now think, with a lesion, if you lost this temporal retina, it's looking over here, but this nasal retina is covering for it. Isn't that cool? Now let's do B. Again, no relative afferent pupil defect because I said only there. So what's happening here? We're losing our two what? We're losing our two nasal retinae, aren't we? We're losing, what's this nasal retinae look at? Yes, yes, yes. What's this nasal retinae look like? Look at, yes, yes, yes. Okay, it's gone. But what's this temporal retina looking at? Yes, yes, yes. And what's this temporal retina looking at? Yes, yes, yes. So you're, you can see a lot with this, this particular case here, with B, because you're seeing everywhere your temporal retinas look. You're just not going to see way out here and way out here. Who cares? You know, and we're not, think about it. Just, can you see anything out there anyway? Look at, think about it. I mean, you know, you can see it, but you don't sure and heck don't pay attention to it. D, D, 
optic tract. Very important. What are you losing here? You're losing this temporal retina. Where's that temporal retina look? Over here. You're losing this nasal retina. Where's this nasal retina? All the way over here. here. So you can't see anything. If you lost D, you could not see anything from this point to this point to this point. Is that better or worse than losing your eye? It's a lot worse than losing your eye. And of course, there's no, there's no relative afferent pupil defect. Optic tract. Now, pretty much the same. You have a lesion here, not going to be any different than a lesion here. All the information here goes here. All the information here goes here. So a lesion of this optic tract is going to give you the same visual field deficits, all right? going to give you the same visual field deficits as a lesion of all the optic radiations or all, the, all of G. We already did E. E is going to the lower bank, so it would be an upper quadrant. F is going to the upper bank, so it would be a lower quadrant. What Dr. Healy didn't talk much about in these quadrinopias here is how are central and peripheral retina distributed along here. Remember, here's your calcarine fissure. Here's your upper bank, your lower bank. So the upper looks lower, lower looks upper. But remember, you also have central and peripheral vision back here. And central would be right back here. Central vision, stuff you can see more of, more macular visions back here, and peripheral visions this way. So it's in this axis that that's mapped. So this would be upper visual field, lower visual field on the opposite side. Central, central. How are you going to remember that? Central. C caudal, C caudal, C caudal, peripheral P. All right. What else here? I think we've done everything, I think. So let's leave you, let's leave it on one here. Um, let me do something here. Okie dokie. Um, visual fields, visual fields, visual fields. Um, hmm. Well, I'll just, uh, I'll just keep going. Now, let's go to the next slide. I'll leave you. Let's do this now. Let's go back here because this is a little deceiving here. You can see everything coming into the, to the pretectum and enter Westfall here. What's deceiving here is most of these fibers are get, oops. These five, if you had a lesion of the optic tract, you wouldn't really, um, information is still going to get into this system here. A lot of these fibers peel off the optic tract before they get even this far, but we won't worry about that. Let's do, uh, everybody knows what Edinger Westfall is, okay, everybody knows, where's that, everybody knows pre is in a real good slide here. Uh, let me go to the next one, see if I can do better. Um, well, I better go back. Oops. Sorry. Oh, audition. Okay. Let's do, um, let's do, let's just say we drew, we, we had the Edinger Westfall here going out to the ciliary ganglion. Synapse in the ciliary ganglion. The ciliary ganglion goes out and um, to the sphincter to constrict. Okay. So, um, Let's say we had a lesion in the Edinger Westfall right here, let's say on the, on the right side. If you had a lesion in the Edinger Westfall, it would no longer turn on the ciliary ganglion cell, which would no longer uh, cause constriction of this pupil. So if, if you had a lesion in Edinger Westfall or anywhere along the third nerve or the ciliary ganglion, you're going to have a blown pupil. You're going to have a dilated pupil in the ipsilateral eye. There's no way that that pupil will constrict. It'll be dilated. Okay, now we can go to the next slide. And let's look at this right here, all right? A, ambient light to pupils are symmetrical. You shine light in the right eye and it constricts, so why would that be? You shine light in the right eye, the light is eventually gonna get to Pretectum, Edinger Westfall, go out the third nerve on both sides and cause constriction. Shine light in the other eye, same thing. So this would be normal. No lesion here. So 
All right. Now let's do an efferent pupil. An efferent pupil is where there's a lesion in Edinger Westfall, the third nerve, the ciliary ganglion, or the fibers from the ciliary ganglion, and you can no longer constrict your pupil. So it's blown. Here's a blown pupil on the left. So Edinger Westfall, cranial nerve three, ciliary ganglion. Something happened that that's blown. But that's the only problem. So this is called an efferent. It's called an efferent because the information is going out of the CNS to the eye. An afferent pupil is because light is get, not getting into the system. Afferent, coming in. This is an efferent. Okay, so this is big. This is big to begin with. This is regular. So we shine light in this eye. And remember, there's no afferent pupil. So light gets in, and this one will constrict. This one can't constrict because it's a blown pupil. It can't get out three. To, it, light will get into the pretectum in Edinger Westfall, but then it can't go out and constrict. Shine light then on this blown pupil side. Just because the pupil is blown doesn't mean the light isn't getting in. It can't react because it's got a, a problem with its Edinger Westfall third nerve ciliary ganglion. But the light is getting in so that the other eye can constrict. So that's a efferent pupil. You should know that, know that pretty well. An afferent pupil is when light is not getting in one eye, and we're saying it's a lesion of the optic nerve. So here it says afferent pupil left eye right here. Okay, so the pupils would be a little larger, right? Does anybody know why? Well, there's less light getting into the pretectum in Edinger Westfall. So there's less stimulation then of the two of uh, of the two Edinger Westfalls. Less stimulation of the Edinger Westfall means that uh, constriction is not as good as it should be. So they're a little bit dilated, but they're symmetrical. So you have an afferent pupil. Light is not going to get in this eye. Okay. Shine light on the good eye, they both constrict. Well, they both constrict because, you know, the, the Edinger Westfall and everything is getting, getting light from this eye. Edinger Westfall going to both eyes. Then you shine your light over the afferent defect. And what has happened here is that it doesn't stay, it doesn't stay this size. So as you go back and forth, since less light is getting into this eye, Okay, this is going to be a little bit bigger, and this is going to be a little bit bigger. Now, there's a question down here. Let's see. Where was that? Now, this was, this was in ambient light here. So because this doesn't get, is, is there some light getting in? That's the question. There is some light getting in because this isn't as big as, as these right here. So some light is getting in, but if you compare this size and this size, um, you can see this is smaller than this. So this would be an afferent pupil in the left eye. Um, this, I don't know if I have, I don't think I have this on the exam, but I did ask today whether this was a left or a right eye up here. And I always go to the disc. The disc is on the left here as you're looking in the person's eyes. So this would be a left eye. This would be the fovea right here. Here's your central retinal artery right here. So this would be a left eye. When you do his hill of visions here, now this is a, the visual field. It, um, now I also, again, will go to the, to, to the disc. Uh, to the di disc is right here, B. So I would say the disc is on the right, so I'd say this is the visual field or hill of vision of the right eye. And what I'm showing here is uh, absence of vision. Look at this. There's can't, the vision right here not seeing much here at C, it's dropping way down here. So this part can't see very well, so I think I, what could possibly give this? Well, you haven't had it, but I know uh, some, this could be either glaucoma or it could be a bit of a detached retina. All right, so I think that's pretty good too. Let's go to the next one. Oh, auditory, auditory, this is easy. I think it's hard for me to write any difficult questions on the auditory system. I guess the heart, let's see. Well, here's your tympanic membrane right here. 
Maliosynchus and stapes right here. So what would this be right here? Well, this is the, is this the oval or round? Well, this is the oval window. Scala what? Scala huh? vestibuli, scala media, scala tympani, round window, oval, round, right here. This part of the basilar membrane is going to be for high frequencies. This part's going to be for low frequencies. This has perilymph. This has endolymph. Um, any lesions out in here, tympanic membrane, here, here, will give you a, a conductive hearing loss. Any lesions in here will give you a sensory neural hearing loss. Um, what else could I ask you here? Fluids, we did that, oval, window. Let's go to the next one. Um, this is a good slide. This needs some explanation. So these are the three rows of outer hair cells. This is a single row of, outer, of inner hair cells. This is the tectorial membrane. This is the basilar membrane. This shows width and thickness. This is the confusing part here. Here, you have an axon coming from this inner hair cell going in to the dorsal and ventrocochlear nuclei. So the cell bodies for these axons would be in the spiral or cochlear ganglion. So you're going to have a ganglion. Some of the are going to pick up the information from the inner hair cell right, right here and continue into the dorsal and ventricochlear nuclei. Now you also have an axon running out from the superior olive. Yep, I know. We didn't talk much about it. Running out from the out, coming out the eighth nerve. I didn't mention it when we talked about brainstem. Dr. Populin didn't talk too much about it either. But this, so in the eighth, auditory part of the eighth nerve here, you have sensory information coming in about sound and also some modulating information coming out from amazing the superior olive. So this cell body right here for this axon is in the superior olive in the pons. It's running out and it's going to somehow control the size and length of these inner hair cells, outer hair cells, sorry. So these can actually get longer and shorter, longer and shorter because they have motors that control the length. And then if these can get longer and shorter, eventually they're going to do something to the tectorial membrane and control the sensitivity that's actually be coming in, the sensitivity of the sounds being picked up by the inner hair cell. So actually, when you get presbycusis like me, <clears throat> At the base of my basilar membrane, I've lost a lot of these um, these uh, outer hair cells here, and um, it's so that my basilar membrane isn't as sensitive as it should be. So even though these now there is some information coming from these in, but not much. So these are being controlled by the brainstem, and they make the basilar membrane much more sensitive. And in fact, like I said, in cases of presbycusis. These cells are dying, not so much these cells, which causes my, my hearing loss. Um, again, don't just remember, down here, going to be high frequencies. Up here, going to be low frequencies. This area up in here would be the helicotrema. Uh, you know about the kinocilium. You have to have movement towards the big kinocilium to get excitation. The other way would be inhibition. Uh, I think that's about it. I think you can answer this question pretty easily. Um, again, don't forget, anything down in here in this conducting apparatus, like say you got a lot of hair or wax in your, out here before the eardrum that give you conductive loss, ear tubes that give you a conductive loss. And your, you know, if your child has ear tubes, you're going to have a little bit of a conductive loss. It's going to heal over, but they should have a little bit of a conductive loss. Middle ear problems are going to give you a conductive loss. Okay, then you get in here, you're going to get a sensory neural loss. Now, what do you got to know here? Ah, yeah, yeah, you know, I've harped and harped and harped on this. I don't know. I, I, I don't know. Um, I hate, I hate this. Uh, I hate the fact that you don't know every little detail. Either give you too much or too little. Sometimes too little kind of gets you all upset. Well, here's the, here's the ganglion. 
So it's coming in from the inner hair cells, goes to the dorsal and ventral cochlear nuclei. That you know. So if you had a lesion here, you're going to be deaf. Now, how do these, now these dorsal and ventral cochlear nuclei have cells whose axons go up. You know, they're going to go up, and some are going to go into the superior olive. Uh, if you're in the superior olive right here, you can cross in this trapezoid body and go into the opposite lateral lemniscus. You can go up this lateral lemniscus here. It's pretty hard to identify. Here's your lateral lemniscus, lateral lemniscus, lateral lemniscus. But this lateral lemniscus has the synapse in the inferior colliculus. How do you know it's the inferior? Well, here's the superior with the ruber duber. Here's the inferior with the decusation of the superior cerebellar peduncle. I think that's a pretty good way of telling the difference. So this lateral lemniscus is a ascending auditory pathway that synapses on cells in the inferior colliculus. Then there's a new bundle that starts. The cells in the inferior colliculus have axons which go, I don't know what this, well, that's supposed to be a cell, I guess, that go up in the brachium. Yeah, here's the brachium of the superior colliculus. Oh, my. Oh, no, they labeled it the brachium of the inferior, so Big John missed that. It's the arm. It's the arm of the inferior colliculus. So think if you had your arm going from here to here up to the medial geniculate, which is just rostral. So your arm, the arm right here, so there's a cell here that projects into the brachium or arm of the inferior colliculus, even though this is a superior colliculus, up to the medial geniculate body. Well, where's the medial geniculate body? It's in the thalamus. Where's the thalamus, Big John? Rostral to level 10 here. So even though we got the superior colliculus here, the ruber duber, the fab four, this little bundle out here, kind of tricky, is the brachium of the inferior colliculus. Where's the cell body? Inferior colliculus. Where's it going? Medial geniculate body. What the heck is the medial geniculate body? It's the thalamus. Once you're in the thalamus, in the auditory thalamus, you're going to go out to the auditory cortex in the temporal lobe, and you're going to use a limb of the internal capsule, the sublenticular limb of the internal capsule. And we saw that. It's a big bundle of axons going onto the lenticular nucleus, the lenticular nucleus being, of course, the putamen. What else? In the globus pallidus, but at the level we saw it, it was mostly the putamen. So what would I ask here? Oh, I don't know. Subtle auditory deficits, things like that. You're probably sick of this, but I'm sure you all get it right. No, this is the inferior. Uh, what else? Mm, lateral limb. If I ask you to ID, that'd be, I don't know. Lateral limbiscus, I guess, is okay. Breaking the inferior clerks, I know since I mentioned it, you, and of course I missed it, you all know it. So I, I feel it's okay to ask you this. And uh, dorsal ventricular, I think you should remember that too. This I like because this is very applied neuroscience. It shows three audiograms. A is an interesting one because it shows if you play the stimulus by air, the top up there, the air, it's perfect. I mean, no, bone is perfect. So there's an air bone gap here. So here they were playing the stimulus probably on your mastoid. Look at that, perfect. Perfecto. Then <clears throat> this would be played by, by air, and it doesn't work as well. And so look how it's, you, this means you've got to play it a lot louder. Here you played it at normal and you heard it via bone. Here you had to play it a lot louder. So there's an air bone gap here, air bone gap. This is an air bone gap, bone air gap. So this means that there must be something wrong in the conducting system, correct? Because if you play it by bone, you're getting right in there and vibrating those fluids. If you're playing it by air, you got to go through the middle ear and all those kind of things. So this number of things could give you this air bone gap. Anybody got any idea? Well, you could have wax and in your ear, you could have something wrong with your middle ear, you could have a middle ear infection, something wrong with the malleus, incus, or stapes. So that's, this is a good one here. This 
could be the air bone gap conductive law. Now here, holy moly, this I call a notch. Now, in most notches, you see it's air and bone, air and bone, air, and then boom, it goes up, drops down. In many cases, can go back up so that the damage is right, the damage is to your basilar membrane only about that part that picks up about 4,000. So it's, we call this a, a notch. So something was damaging, something was playing at about 4,000 here, loud enough to damage your basilar membrane only pretty much at the 4,000, where the 4,000 is represented. And it's quite commonly said this could be a, a farmer driving a loud tractor or somebody shooting a gun a lot, a hunter, or even loud rock concerts. So this is the notch, but it's again, it's uh, sensory neural. Now here, this is me. This is presbycusis. How do I know it's presbycusis? Because there's a gradual decline, especially of the higher frequencies, it's sensory neural. And so this would be near somewhere near the, the base of my, or the, the patient's um, cochlea, sensory neural. Now remember now, even though it's sensory neural, if I did the Rene test, if I did the Rene test, think about, it. it's sensory neural, and if I did the Rene test, would air be better than bone? If I did the Rene test, would air be better than bone? Yes, even though I have a sensory neural loss, I still got some response, responsiveness, and air is always better than bone. Because why would we have our, you know, we wouldn't have all the malleus incus and stapes if it wasn't. So in a Rene test, air would be better than bone. Now in this case, if they did the Weber, with his air bone gap, if they did the Weber, say this is the right ear, and the right ear has a conductive loss. If they did the Weber, put that tuning fork up in the middle of your top of your head up there, if you have a conducting loss in the right ear, you're going to hear it louder in the right ear. You're going to hear it louder in the right ear, ear because you haven't, you know, you, the hearing has been affected in that ear, not used to hearing it, and so you're going to hear it louder in the conductive ear problem side. All right? So let's see what else here. That's that. I don't think you'll miss anything here. You shouldn't. Remember, this is Big John, and you've put up with me. This is presbycusis. Presbycusis. Not presbyopia. You should know presbyopia. You know what that is. So this is presbycusis. Airbone gap, notch, presbycusis. Oh, this just shows it here. Oh, I know. He didn't talk much about this. He didn't talk much about it. Here's What's this? This is on the bone. And then you'd go from bone to the, if you're doing the Rene test, bone to air. Here's the good old Weber right here. Now, this, this, brain, this auditory brainstem responses here. What this is is that they, for, for mostly done for kids, and you can test hearing in a, actually in a, a newborn. And you play a little click in their ear, and their head is covered with lots of recording electrodes. It kind of looks like an old-style bathing cap, uh, like, like people, well, I didn't wear one, but a bathing cap with lots of little recording electrodes on it. And when you play the click in your ear, you get the auditory pathways kind of all firing together. The first thing that will fire will be like uh, the cochlea, the nerve. Then it will come into like the cochlear nuclei. Then it will go up to the superior olive. Then it will go up to the inferior colliculus. So you can see when all, when you can tell in this reading here, here's normal. And um, let me get my pointer up. Here's normal. So this could be like, um, I, I can't actually remember, but one would be when, when the cochlea and the nerve is firing, and uh, three might be when, um, oh, it could be the superior olive or something. So as you move from the receptor up to get it up to cortex, you're going to get these volleys of auditory activity that'll, that'll, that, that, that can be normalized. So this is a normal auditory brainstem response. So then, of course, when you start seeing glitches, when this doesn't look normal, 
then you can start to figure out where the lesion is. The lesion could be all in the cochlea, in the nerve, or in the superior olive, cochlear nuclei, things like that. So that's all this really means. And he didn't explain this, but I think I had a, I think I had a practice question on it. It was right here. Let's see. Patient complains about reduced hearing in his or her left ear. Left ear. And then I went down here and asked a question. Brainstem evoked response would show decreased latency. Well, that, I mean, that would be better than normal. I mean, you know, you, if, if, if it's decreased latency, it happens faster than normal. Actually increase. It takes longer to get going. It get, it, some of the, one of these will be longer because things are not working normally, so it takes a little longer to get to the next step. So I don't think I'll ask you anything about this on the exam because Luis didn't, didn't talk much about it. So I think everybody will be able to handle this one. Oh, now we're on cortex. I look up at the clock and it says 347. I think I only got till 4 o'clock, so I can see there's going to be a, a part 1 and a part 2. And um, let's go over this. I think sometimes my, my little things move around. Let's go through this. You know this is a what? Broca's. Tan. Here's tan. And Broca's left hemisphere. Left hemisphere. Don't forget that. It's got to be in the left hemisphere. Here's Broca's. And this area right around here would be Wernicke's. Here's Wernicke. So Broca, here's the lesion. It's a big, this was a big, I think it was a, a vascular blowout that eventually formed a cyst. So this, per, this particular person had a, a Broca's aphasia. And you can see it's up here in the inferior frontal gyrus on the left side. So this, this per tan, could, the only words tan could say were tan, tan, tan. Tan was very frustrated. And um, I don't know, but tan had a good chance of having a, a contralateral hemiplegia. So here would be the left side. So you'd have a, a Broca's aphasia. If it got into the motor strip here, you could have, you could see it, it could, you could have problems on the opposite side moving, but this is the lesion right here. And so he'd be frustrated with, a, with the potential of a contralateral hemiplegia. Wernicke is back here in more of a receiving type aphasia. It's further away from the motor strip. This must be the central, uh, central sulcus here. So here's the motor strip. Here's your sensory strip. So let's go through some of these um, that are in. So uh, left inferior frontal gyrus, I'd like you to know. Oh, blood supply to these, of course, is what? Middle, because your lateral fissure is going to have that middle cerebral, going to get, this is middle cerebral, this is middle cerebral. Um, what else? Uh, Broca's aphasia is a problem in articulation. No, it's just that you can't, get the words out, but your articulation isn't too bad. I mean, Tan probably said Tan pretty well. He didn't say when or something like that. Um, this is an aphasia. Remember, it's not an apraxia. Apraxia is motor planning. Central sulcus, yes, that's up here. I don't know how it got down here. Sorry about that. My, my things move around. Left hemisphere, frustrated. Potential right hemiplegia, without a doubt. Can this person comprehend? Yes. Why? Well, because that the information's coming in here. What he's hearing or reading or things like that coming in, he can comprehend. Uh, what else uh, broke his different or loss of hemisphere? Oh, lesion of this hemisphere neglect? No. Why would you not? If you had a big lesion up here, could you get ne right neglect? Well, it turns out there's, there's hardly any right neglect. Now, I'm not going to say there isn't a case of right neglect, but it's mostly left neglect, and that would have to be on the right side, on the right hemisphere in this area, mostly middle cerebral uh, artery distribution. When we think of a, a Wernicke's aphasia, we, we certainly think of word salad, not Broca's. And uh, anything else in here? Lesion, lesion results in preserved artery? Yes. Okay. Um, a Wernicke's aphasia, what would they, well, they have trouble receiving, and also, man, they use all kinds of funny words. They're very fluent, though. This fellow, Tan, is not fluent. Now, I'd like to say 
that um, I'd like to say, somebody just opened a door. Sorry, I'm using this. Um, I'd like to say that um, I'm fluent. You know, I'm talking fluently. But fluent to me is just normal conversation like this, fluent. Tan was not fluent, but Wernicke's aphasia, they're very fluent. They can talk up a storm. It's very nice, regular, smooth talk. But they got all kinds of crazy words in there, a word salad, salad, <laughs> paraphasias, things like that. Now, it's 3.52, so I think I'm going to probably have to end up here because somebody just came in. But let me see what the next slide is so I know where part one is going to end here. Part one is going to, oh, I might as well do this. This again here, shown over here, this person has what we'd call right neglect. He was asked to circle, he or she was asked to circle all the stars, and look what they did. They only circled things on the right. They neglecting the left side, left neglect. So it's a right parietal temporal lesion, a right parietal temporal lesion for left neglect. These people don't even know that the left side belongs to them. They won't shave. They could be hemiplegic. They'll say they're not hemiplegic. So right hemispheric, parietal temporal. Again, down here, Phineas Gage. I'll tell you what, I'll come back. We'll start on this because I want to go through everything that Phineas doesn't have. So I'll, I'll stop here and come back. Part two will start right here. Thanks a lot. I'll talk to you tomorrow.